Hey, hello everybody. <clears throat> this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure. <clears throat> I noticed my throat's, throat is getting a little bit hoarse. Maybe I just raised my voice a little too much a minute ago <clears throat> and irritated it. <clears throat> Hopefully my voice will hold up. But uh, welcome everybody. I'm happy to be with you all again this Friday night. And uh, I'm happy to have with me here again, uh, Brother Dave, Sister Lisa, Sister Paula, and who knows, maybe uh, Sister Renee will join us, and uh, Brother Cripps. Uh, they've also received the invitation to join, so we'll see if they can make it or not. Uh, but uh, everybody in the chat room, blessings to all of you, our congregation. <clears throat> now, let me tell everybody in the congregation, uh, the chat room there, um, if you desire that we uh, respond to your comment, or if you have a question that you want us to answer, you need to put it in all caps. That's the only way I'm going to really, it'll stand out, you'll get my attention. <clears throat> and uh, Friday nights, the whole pur purpose of this program is to be as involved with the chat room as possible, much as possible. So uh, I'm hoping that... Uh, Whatever you want us to engage with, you'll put it in all caps so we'll, we'll know what's on your mind. Uh, but let's start off with the panelists. Uh, to each one of you gets a chance to say hi, and, and I want to see what's on your mind tonight. And ladies first, how about you, Brother Dave? <laughs> hey, what's going on, everyone? Uh, welcome to Friday Fellowship. I hope you all had a blessed week. Uh, happy to be here. Ex excited for tonight, Fellowship, and uh, to hear what the panel and the chat has to say. Um, just, you know, thankful for another day. Every day above ground is a good one. Well, brother, uh, I'm sorry to report to you. I would rather be dead. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, I hear you, Luke. I hear you because I would rather be with the Lord too. But I know that there's so much work to do. And, you know, God put us here in this time period, uh, you know, to, to try to plant and water as many seeds as we can. Yeah, I know. I couldn't resist that. That's that's <laughs> that's one of my standard lines when people ask me, "How are you doing?" Well, I'm fantastic. Everything's great. But I, I, the only thing that would be better is if I was dead. What? Then it leads into the gospel. Okay, we also got Sister Lisa with us for the Most High Jesus. Hey, praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Blessings to everyone on the panel and blessings to everyone in the chat. And thank you again for having me, Brother Lou. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Great to have you with us again tonight, sister. And uh, we also have uh, Sister Paula. You want to say hi to everybody? Hey, everybody. Uh, Luke, Lisa, Dave, and everybody in the chat room. It's good to be here again. Happy Friday. Yes, thank you, thank you. When you said Luke, you kind of let exaggerate Luke. Well, people have, over the years, have kind of taken my name Luke and identified certain things with it, like Luke Skywalker, Cool Hand Luke, <laughs> Luke Perry. And of course, I want to be identified with Luke, the writer of Acts and the book of Luke. But most people don't think of it that way. But um, yeah, this is Brother Luke. But if you want, you can just call me Cool Breeze. Because when I enter the room, it's like a cool breeze. What? Wait, Brother Luke, there is a, uh, I think there's a movie called Cool Hand Luke. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic. It's a great one with Paul Newman. Have yeah. <laughs> no, I just, for some reason, the title just came to mind. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, anybody who has not seen Cool Hand Luke has missed one of the greatest movies ever. Okay, we also have with us Brother Matthias uh, hiding behind the scenes producing the program. And uh, before we, we get into the conversation, Matthias, did you want to say anything? Anything. Ah, <laughs> All right, man, a few words and, and quite a sense of humor, too. Matthias, you're not really known for your sense of humor. Right? I know, but I try. <laughs> I'm known for failed attempts at humor. <clears throat> all right. Uh, let me see with the panel, first of all, here, what's on your mind. 
Uh, obviously, I've got some things that I'm ready to talk about if if we get dead air. But uh, I'm really I want to hear what you want to talk about. So uh, let me ask ladies first, uh, Sister Paula. Uh, anything on your mind that you would like to have discussed? Um. <laughs> Uh, not anything that's right off the top of my head. There's been stuff I've been thinking about, but uh, I don't know that it would be, you know, something that other people would want to talk about. So, well, okay. If you're not that uh, committed to it, just pu put that on hold. We'll resort to those topics uh, if we run out of things to talk about then, okay? All right. Sounds good. Well, that'll be a backup plan. Uh, how about Sister Lisa? Anything on your mind that you would like uh, the congregation to discuss? No, Brother Luke, I don't really have a topic in mind. Uh, I'm kind of in the same camp with Sister Paula. I'll just, I'm here and willing to field anything that uh, the people in the chat would like to talk about or anyone else on the panel. All right, okay. All right, then that leaves it up to uh, Brother Dave. Brother Dave, any topics or anything? Uh... I'm open tonight, Brother Luke. Um, whatever's on your guys' mind, uh, you know, whatever the chat is is uh, dealing with this week, um, I'm open for anything tonight. Yes. All right. Uh, well, since uh, nobody's brought anything up, let me get the conversation going by saying that um, Brother Ronnie has been a friend of mine for a long time, uh, Hood Minister, St. Hood. Uh, he, he, he has a lot of different, he's changed the name of his channel numerous times, uh, but he identifies as a Hood because, you know, he was uh, one of these uh, biker gang guys for a long time. And, uh, but of course now he's a saint and he, he's one of the most articulate um, saints I know with the, with the written word. Uh, if you ever see sainthood or uh, hood minister, any, any, you'd see him in a, the comments and make sure you stop and read his comment. I guarantee you, you'll be blessed. His, his, reading his comments is almost like reading the Psalms. They're just poetic and beautiful and deep. Um, but he coined a phrase years ago and I've been repeating it, and I've been encouraging everybody else to repeat it as a slogan. And, and that is, oh, we, we have a license to rest. Isn't that beautiful? A license to rest. You know, we're, we're accused of teaching that you have a license to sin, but even Paul was accused of that. And he says, well, God forbid. You know, they made a lot of accusations against him, and we're in good company because company, we get accused of the same thing Paul was accused of. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, uh, but no, we're not giving teaching people to have the license to sin, but you have a license to rest. So maybe you can respond to that. Uh, wh what would that mean to you if you had to define what is it, a license to rest? Anyone? Well, I love the fact that, uh, you know, when you learn to rest, that's when, you know, things really uh, begin to be understood in, in more, you know, you get a fuller understanding when you're able to rest in Christ. Because when you're still sin conscious and you're still uh, uh, being dr uh, drowned in condemnation and you're still uh, striving and, and still unsure of your standing with God. Uh, based on how well you're performing, you you really lose out on a lot of, um, you know, revelation from God's word. You lose out on a lot of peace, a lot of joy, a lot of intimacy with the Lord. And so learning to rest is very vital. Uh, learning to know who you are by faith in Christ uh, and, and, and learning about God's grace and how, you know, there's, it, it's hard to explain because once the transition takes place and, and you come out of that, fear and that bondage and that sense of duty and that, and you know, that, that dread in, in walking with the Lord is, and you know, you come to learn how to rest and then you find peace and joy and fulfillment and relationship. And it's just like night and day. It's almost like a, 
you know, the, the light switch goes off or it comes on and the dark turns to light. And it's, you know, it's so amazing, but it's really hard to put into words. So until I learned about the rest, you know, it was just, uh, it was tough. Mm -hmm. I found it for many, many of us, I think many of the true believers, they still find it uh, difficult to rest. Uh, uh, matter of fact, maybe you can tell me the verse I have in mind, something about we struggle to rest, we we wrestle to rest or something like that. What is it? How, what's that word? What's that scripture that I'm thinking of? Well, I know the one that says we now have entered into his rest. No, but I'm talking about the verse that seems to be an oxymoron, two, two conflicting things, like we're we're working at resting, something like that. Oh, okay. labor, labor to enter. Well, labor, into the yeah. Rest. Well, how does it go again? Labor to enter into the rest, something yeah. like that. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's in Hebrew. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? The labor I, I, to me, I, I think that's the case for many of the the brethren, and what I call the sistren. We're, we have to labor because we, for some reason, we have a hard time resting naturally, so we have to make an effort. And even Paul says, labor to enter his rest. So it must not be natural or easy just to rest and, and just give it all to Jesus, not only just initially to get our salvation, but after we're saved to just rest and, and let him handle everything for us. Yeah, um, Brother Luke, that's Hebrews 4.3. Uh, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter to my rest, although the works are finished from the foundation of the world. Hebrews 4.5, and then again in this place again. if the, He's talking about entering into his rest, and it says the one who has entered into his rest has ceased from their own labor. That's in Hebrews chapter 4, if they want to see it in context. Hello? You're muted, Luke. God. Oh. I keep, I, I'm mute when I turn my fan on because I'm afraid the fan's going to cause a noise. So I forget to turn the microphone back on. Hey, Brother Walker. Hallelujah. Arlo Walker is here. Brother... Uh, you need to answer your phone. I've called you a half dozen times and left messages. I've been praying and worried about you. So please, I'm just so happy to see you here. At least I know you're still uh, with us. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm glad you're with us tonight here in the congregation. But let's, let's talk on the phone if, if your phone's still working. <clears throat> okay. Uh, all right, so uh, we're talking about resting, and uh, I want to ask everybody in the congregation, uh, are you able to rest, or are you laboring to enter that rest? Come on, chat room, let us know. Uh, those of you who are just, you're just resting perfectly, and you, you're really, you really got this rest down, you've mastered it, or, or are you... Uh, are you really struggling? Are you laboring to enter the rest? Um, how about Paulo? What, are, 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 are you got this resting down? Have you mastered it? Um, I have entered into the rest, yes, but uh, I did labor to get there. Um, it does sound like an oxymoron. Uh, but, you know, the Old Testament talks about, let me see if I can find a verse. It talks about um, in Leviticus 16, 31, it says, It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you. This is the, the Sabbath. And ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And in uh, Leviticus sixteen twenty nine, it says, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. Um. It is, it's contrary to our natural minds to do nothing. It's in fact difficult to do nothing, to just rest. That's why it says of the Sabbath to afflict your souls. And he, he specifies that and do no work at all. Um, it was difficult to not work, but it was for a point to show that we rest in Christ. He's done everything. 
Um, and also in Isaiah 28, 19, it says, from the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you for morning by morning shall it pass over you by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. And the report is, uh, you know, the gospel that was preached to, to them. And it's a vexation only to understand it because I think it goes against what our natural mind tells us is right. In, our, in the natural world, you do something in order to get something. And it's very difficult mentally to get to the point where you truly believe that it's been done for you completely, entirely. I understand why it's called arrest because it's just peace. It's like a peace that you can't even explain. Like the Bible says, a peace that passes all understanding. Um, and it's only a place you can get to with much labor. And that's not doing a bunch of good stuff, but it probably involves that. It's more a, a mental labor. It's yeah. difficult to accept that you get the greatest gift that's ever been offered for nothing. It, it, it was difficult for me. I, I can't imagine what it's like for good people, like people who were raised in the church have done good their whole life. It must be awful to try to put aside all their good deeds and count them as dung like Paul did to understand what God has done for you. I, it was difficult for me because I was cynical and thought, you know, well, if this sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, so I did labor mentally to, to get to that point where he showed me the truth and I believed. And that's the rest. And praise God for it. Yeah. Very well said, Sister. Uh, uh, and, you know, um, Sister Victoria, she wrote, rest in the finished work of Jesus turn away from your self-righteous works. So I said, that is the gospel, by the way, that we need to not work at earning salvation, instead rest in the finished work of Christ. Trust what Christ has done for us and rest and believe his promise. You're guaranteed eternal life. Oh, now, we, I think we all understand that, everybody here in the congregation, you, got, you get that, so you got that. You got salvation, but after we're saved, what about resting? Uh, are you resting? Or are you still having struggles? Um, there is a question here uh, we got from uh, someone else uh, about speaking in tongues. I've got somebody else I wanted to bring up too, but I told you I wanted to I wanted to respond to the chat room, and the first one to put it in all caps here is a question, can you discuss speaking in tongues? Okay, be, Stephen Alfred, Stafford, be, before we go on to that, I wanna see if any of the panelists wanna say any more about resting before we we leave from leave that subject. Anyone? Yeah, yeah, I just would wanna reference people to Hebrews, the entire chapter of chapter four is speaking about um, the fear of the Lord and how uh, if you, don't believe in his promise then you can't rest see this is a promise from god almighty about what jesus has accomplished and what he has done the evidence is that he was raised from the dead had he had had one speck of sin on him he couldn't have been raised because he went and ascended and went to the father and now uh and, and then came back remember when he told the uh women who came to the tomb he said don't don't touch me i've not yet ascended to my father there was a proof that he could enter into the presence of god because he had no sin on him and uh, if people don't rest in what jesus has done and they just continue to engage in their works uh, they they can't have the proper peace of mind thinking that that's that's what ingratiates them before god the very last scripture there in in uh hebrews chapter 4 um it actually if you back up to about verse 14 it says seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast to our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities 
but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is grace and truth. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And so when we rest in him, when we rest in the blessed assurance of Christ, you know, there is no reason for us to ever be troubled about sin. I didn't say we shouldn't have godly sorrow if we blow it and make a mistake and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about ever worry about the loss of salvation because you may have blown it or made a mistake or sin, which the Bible says is, is just missing the mark. So we need to rest in his blessed assurance. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that is really the heart of getting our salvation. And then that's also the heart of living out our, our faith. Um, now, Celine made a comment that she did write something in all caps. But when I go back, Celine, the only thing I'm seeing is you're saying that you think I'm actually funny. Celine says, I find you to be very funny. Well, I'm glad you're amused. Do I amuse you? <coughs> am, I, am I here to amuse you? That's from Goodfellas, by the way, in case that's another attempt at humor <clears> that, <throat> you know, was lost on everyone. Uh, okay. Um, anything else on that before we go to this uh, subject? Uh, uh, he's asking us to talk about the subject of speaking in tongues. Um, does anybody here on the panel speak in tongues? Even, you know, okay. Uh, I do. Then, oh, okay. All right. Well, do you want to talk about it at all? You feel uh, like you're going to get, gonna get me in trouble, brother Luke. Well, well uh, you're not going to be in trouble, but but I'm just if you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. But no, I don't. I don't have a problem talking about it. It'd probably be better suited if people were asking specific questions about it. I mean, it's a general uh, subject. We can refer to the scripture and what yeah, Paul his, said no, about let me, it. Let me see his uh, if what. The specific question is really quite non-specific, the way you wrote it. Let me see. Maybe you could elaborate further if you want to know more exactly about uh, about that. But let me find the question again. Where is it? Why am I having such a hard time finding uh, the all caps again? Wow. I don't see it. Maybe he removed it. Maybe I just... But he just asked if we can discuss speaking in tongues. I think that's all, all, all that was asked. So, uh, all right, um, I, I'll give you my thoughts on it. Unless you want to, um, Lisa, you're you're the only one that actually uh, does speak in tongues. So, uh, and Victoria says I have the gift of tongues. So, Victoria, if you want to comment anything, say anything about it, we want to hear what you have to say. But Lisa, if you want to tell us, go ahead. Well, um, the Bible refers to it as our our heavenly tongue, our heavenly prayer language. And I do speak uh, in tongues, in prayer, um, in intercessory prayer, um, mostly for, uh, you know, the saints of God. I pray in the spirit for people as the Lord lays them on my heart. Um, just some quick scripture references to people who may want to glean some more information you can look at first corinthians twelve ten, uh, where it talks about the the uh gifts of the spirit concerning tongues uh first corinthians fourteen five, where paul talks about i would that you spake in tongues but rather that she prophesy um first corinthians 4 14 18 i thank my god that i speak with tongues more than ye all um acts in, in the second chapter where it it talks about when the holy spirit came and uh how they began to speak with tongues so i mean like i said w w without answering a specific question just showing that it that it is in the bible it is in the new covenant i do believe it's for any saint of god that will request it of the lord i believe he'll he'll give it to them if they desire it um I know people that, uh, like at certain churches where they'll teach tearing for it, but that's not really, not really 
um, biblical per se. I'm not saying there's anything wrong if if they do it that way. I know people have received the Holy Spirit um, tearing, but uh, you can also simply just ask. I know story of one particular preacher who simply asked the Lord for the the uh, gift of speaking in tongues, and uh, one morning while he was shaving, <laughs> he just. Holy Spirit touched him, and he was able to start speaking in tongues from that moment forward many years ago. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's not it's not something to be afraid of. You're not going to receive an unclean spirit. I think if anyone is uh, involved in any way with an unclean spirit, then that person is not saved. If they have a, something speak through them that's, that's not of God in, in that manner. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and there, Victoria, and I think, let me see, I don't know if John, or let me see who is, August. I'm sorry, someone else said that they speak in tongues, but I think that they were doing it, saying it as a joke. Uh, but, uh, so if you do speak in tongues in the chat room, put it in all caps so I can find it and, and identify uh, who, who is uh, speaking in tongues. But uh, my, uh, I, I don't speak in tongues, I've tried. I, many years ago, I was in a small church that was Pentecostal, and uh, they spoke in tongues, and they told me to pray for it and to get this gift of tongues. And I, I even tried speaking in tongues, but I, I came to the conclusion that I was fabricating it, that it wasn't really from God for me. However, uh, what about Lisa? What about Victoria? What about all my other friends who do speak in tongues? Uh, I, I'm not challenging the validity of that. I'm just saying for me, I don't speak in tongues, but the, here's my, my, my concern on this subject, though, is the, the group of people who um, the Pentecostal uh, usually is the ones that, that do, do this. They, they say, if you don't speak in tongues, it's proof that you know, don't have the Holy Spirit and you didn't get saved. So when, when you, um, it's, it's like, um, it's the same thing about if you don't have this, big changes in your life as proof of salvation you didn't get saved that kind of a thing is is a, a false uh, doctrine false gospel and to and try to impose that uh, on on others uh, is um, that's where i would object that and the same thing like with kjv onlyism i was kjv only for 25 years now i'm kjv first or kjv preferred uh, I like looking at other translations, too, but um, I believe the KJVs and tr trust the KJV. And I, but I believe if someone else wants to be KJV only, good for you. What I'll object to, though, is if the KJV only is wants to impose it on the rest of us. And uh, Lisa's not imposing tongues on us. And Victoria is not. And uh, but uh, I would not feel comfortable either you know, challenging them on it. I, I have no doubt about their sincerity. Um, let me see. Uh, Paula, what did you say? Do you know anything about this subject? Um, I know very little. All I know about the whole speaking in tongues is anything I've read in the Bible. Um, I know when I have seen video footage of some Pentecostal churches, it seems weird and strange. Um, I do know that the Bible talks about this idea of speaking in tongues. There's a good chunk of Corinthians in there that talks about it. So I know it is a thing. Um, I don't think it's a whole lot of language that's not understood. There is some kind of, I guess, angelic language that the Bible speaks of. But from what, from my understanding and reading about the tongues, it's mostly talking about um, someone standing up and speaking in a language that's not their native language, and then also another person standing up and interpreting that, and these people not, that that wasn't their, origi their original language, so they wouldn't have known it, as it's like a miracle or something. And that's what I've, that's how I read it in the Bible. I've never seen that before. Um, I don't want tongues. <laughs> I've never asked for it. Um, I think it would freak me out a little bit. I don't really see the benefit of it, but I know that there is some sort of uh, 
something. It says something about benefit benefiting somebody or somehow, maybe just the person. So I don't know that it's supposed to be on display for everyone to see, especially if there's no understanding that comes from it for the people that are listening. I don't know. Matthias might want to talk about it because he he was the one I was talking to about how it's portrayed in the Bible about the different languages, yeah. if he's listening. Yeah, okay, we'll let Matthias talk about it if he wants. But let me say, I know I've heard Renee talk about this and she had some interesting ideas, but uh, I, I believe that there are, uh, uh, I, might, I might be wrong, Renee thinks there's one type of tongues, uh, but I, I think the Bible indicates there are two types of tongues. Uh, when Peter gave his first sermon, and people were speaking and everybody understood them in their own language. Um, uh, that was one type where uh, there was no interpreter needed. It was, and it was, uh, uh, it was actually a, a language, uh, a known language that people spoke. They understood it in that language. In other words, I'm speaking English, but let's say the entire audience right now, way listening to me, you didn't hear me in English. You heard me in your, your language. I think that's what happened uh, at that time. Then there's other times speaking in tongues where it seems to be, uh, I think Paul called it ecstatic utterances, if I'm remembering it right. And, and it seems to be um, maybe a, a spiritual language that uh, is, is really not a known language. Um, and uh, uh, and then Paul has a protocol, a, a, a clearly defined protocol that has to be followed because there's it was causing confusion in the church. So he said, if you're gonna do this among others, you have to make sure only one person's doing it at a time and that there's always an interpreter, someone who has a gift of interpreting, otherwise there's no value in it. But from what I am seeing today among our uh, brethren uh, is that those people who tell me they are speaking in tongues, it se seems to be a private thing uh, of prayer is, that, is how it's being used. Uh, Dave, what do you say? Uh, I was hoping you didn't call on me, but it's all right because we're all brethren and it's not a salvation issue. So um, I'll be glad to share my opinion on uh, the tongues thing um, from my study. Um, I also, like you, Luke, uh, I came up at a Pentecostal church and I believed that I had received the gift of tongues. I can robo I can do that all day long like everyone else. But me, um, I kind of just, it's a, for me, it's a learned behavior. It benefits nothing. It's absolutely pointless. And as I studied the scripture, uh, when Paul talks about praying in the spirit, he makes a very clear, um, um, you know, analogy in the same verse in first Corinthians 14, I think it's verse 15. He says, if I pray in the spirit, I pray also with the understanding. So when I used to sit in my room and show and do that all night long, I had no understanding. And eventually I felt in my spirit, God just told me to cut it out. And so I just left it alone. And, you know, I don't knock anybody who believes they have the gift of tongues. I just personally believe that it's uh, exactly what the Bible described. And it's the supernatural ability to speak in another language that you don't normally speak so that God's word can be passed along. And I think that it was given to the apostles uh, so they can spread God's word throughout the different nations, tribes and, and people. And uh, I don't find any evidence in the Bible for an angelic tongue. I see Paul speaking in like a uh, hyperbole when he says, even if I were to speak in the tongues of angels, he's saying, if I have love, it's nothing. I think that's more of like a metaphorical hyperbole, but I mean, that's just me. And again, there's people that truly believe they have tongues and I don't knock them for it. And the only thing that I say is if you have tongues and it's a private prayer language for you, just do it between you and God. I don't, I don't want to see it out in public because I'm going to look at you like you're crazy. Cause I don't know what you're saying. All right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, obviously, uh, you're entitled to that conclusion, and uh, I know you, you're not saying it to hurt anybody's feelings. No, but. not at all. And I just want to—I just want to point out that when it talks about praying in the spirit, whether it be in Jude or whether it be in Corinthians or whether it be in Romans, it—you know—in Romans it makes a, a very specific statement that says the spirit, the spirit itself, prays on our behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. 
And therefore, if, if it, you know, I understand it to be, if it cannot be uttered, then, then I, sh you know, it shouldn't be coming out of my mouth. It's something that the spirit does on our behalf, almost like Jesus interceding for us. We don't know what he's interceding for us, but we know that he's interceding for us, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, there was a great need and purpose for it at the beginning of the church because it was an outward sign of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and this conversion. Uh, and so, uh, and I, I think that probably continued for a long time. Uh, I, I, as I said in the beginning, I, I would not want anybody to impose that as a test today, saying that if you have, if you don't have this as a demonstrate tongues. And see, I believe that uh, this uh, this spirit in the believer. At first, you have the baptism of the spirit. That's the an initial faith. The Holy Spirit enters you and brings your spirit to life. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the Pentecostals would say that baptism of the Holy Spirit, if it does happen, that at that time, you'd be speaking in tongues as a sign. And that's, in fact, what happened in the uh, early church. Um, but then you also have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Once we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit doesn't leave like it did before Pentecost. The Spirit would come and go in, in, in prophets. Which Jesus even breathed into his disciples the Holy Spirit to give them power to do miracles, but they were not sealed with it until Pentecost. So, uh, but we we have the baptism of the Spirit. We have the permanent indwelling or seal. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and then we have the grieving of the Spirit and quenching of the Spirit. All of these are all things that have to do with the Holy Spirit in us. Now, uh, but what I would object to is people who are saying that, uh, as I said. Have to speak in tongues. Yeah. The last thing I'll say, Dave, is that um, even though I don't speak in tongues, and even though I, uh, you know, I, I, I think that some of the things that were gifts that uh, I believe that these things have ceased. They didn't cease entirely, apparently, because we have brethren and sistren who are doing some of these things, uh, speaking in tongues and maybe other gifts that, but. Uh, there. Are, uh, how would I explain it? I mean, I'm not. I don't believe that Lisa and Victoria and other people we, we know that they're deluded. No, I'm just saying. For me personally, for me yeah. personally, I I don't. That's what I'm saying. If a brother or sister believes they have a, a prayer language or they have it, that's cool. You know what I mean? And and I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. That's what they. Uh, you know, utilize or exercise. That's fine. I'm just saying for me, like you personally, for me, it just wasn't something for me. And I, I did it for many years and I wholeheartedly believed I had the gift of tongues. And I just, I felt in my spirit after a lot of study that God just told me to cut it out and that it, you know, it wasn't for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, Paula, you said that Matthias w might want to talk about it. it Matthias? You listening? Yeah, he, he just... He was just right here, and he just heard you call on him, so he ran back to the back room. He should be there about now. Oh, okay. When he gets back, then he can let me know. Uh, uh, just a little bit out of breath, maybe, but... <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, from, what I, from what I heard, um, what I see in Scripture on 1 Corinthians 14, that there is some sort of prayer language, and I know saints that were people that I consider to uh, to be believers by their confession that tell me that they have experienced such prayer I I, I not call I I just can't say that I know what the experience is I've never gone through it but I don't deny it or think that it's not there because of what I read in the Bible um, but for the most part, I think tongues is, is, uh, and I think it'll be used a lot, actually, uh, in the end times, where God will allow the barrier of language to be demolished supernaturally. And so uh, I have heard of different examples where, you know, um, the, the person starts speaking Chinese. They've never spoken Chinese. 
and they're just preaching the gospel, but Chinese words are coming out of their mouth and everyone at the table doesn't even, they don't speak Chinese except for one person. Uh, but the whole supernatural experience um, is to help bring clarity. So you have somebody who doesn't speak a language, let's say Chinese, and uh, they start speaking it and everyone around, they don't understand it. And then there's another miracle where somebody else will stand up and God will give them the interpretation so that the person giving the interpretation, like what we see in scripture, actually brings more clarity to the situation because now the person who it was directed towards, i.e. Chinese, they're understanding because it's in their native language. But now because there's another miracle that's happening, not just the person speaking in tongues, but the person translating, another miracle from God brings more clarity and total clarity of of what's going on in that particular uh, circumstance. So I've heard of examples where that has actually happened in this day and age um, from godly men that I I trust and believe. So I see that being more as the what we see in Acts, the type of uh, tongues that was speaking spoken, as where everybody. Um, uh, but it, there is a little bit of difference because um, I, I think that there's three types of, of tongues. There's the one that we're talking about, the prayer language. Then there's one where the person speaking actually speaks the different language. But then what we see in Acts is I think that the prayer, the tongues happened <coughs> in the ear uh, because they name the 17 different languages and say we all we hear them in our native tongue. So I think the that the miracle can happen either from the point of somebody speaking or in the hear in the ears of the hearers um, changing the language at that point. So I think uh, God separated the languages supernaturally at Babylon. And I think then and now he, with his mighty power, can break such barriers. And I actually see some of the technology that's coming out um, recently actually uh, trying to uh, mimic God's ability, you know, like where you speak into this device and it automatically translates it into another language. Um, doing it with technology, but God will show, I think, in the end times that uh, he doesn't need technology. He does it with his superpower. Mm -hmm. Brother Luke, yes. I'd like to say a couple of other things. Um, when you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, in verse 2, it says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit the spirit, the spirit, he speaketh. Howbeit in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. So there's there are different kinds of tongues, as Matthias was referring to, where everybody heard people in their own language. But there is a heavenly tongue that is expressly and only spoken directly to God, as the scripture indicates. And uh, this is the tongues that I'm speaking about when I say I pray in tongues, because you have other times where personal praying tongues. And the gifts of the spirit are operational in a church where someone will prophesy, but they do it in tongues. And then someone else, either that person will interpret or someone else will interpret. And it will never contradict the word of God. Uh, also, if you drop down to verse four, it said, uh, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesied edifieth the church. So. If you, you look up the word edify, basically a synonym would be uplift or builds up. And so I, and I can certainly tell you that that's one of my experiences when I am praying in the spirit. Uh, if I'm having difficulty in battling something, uh, my spirit is uplifted. And then the last thing I would say is in a witness of prayer uh, for praying not only for myself or others in the spirit, 
I have had experiences where uh, I give you one example with my brother. He was praying in tongues for a particular job that he wanted. And the job, uh, there were, I think there were about four to 5,000 applicants because it was a city job. It was a union job. It was a very high paying job. And out of the four to 5,000 applicants, there were only 20 people they were going to select. And he was one of them. And he prayed in the spirit for three months uh, prior to his interview to get that job. Uh, another example would be even myself. Uh, when I was having great difficulty in finding employment, I, I just spent a lot of time just praying in the spirit and asking the Lord to lead me and guide me in my direction and whatever you know, and I had really just been having some difficulty this one particular year getting a job. And my mother works at a hospital and she was at work one day. And this gentleman who was a preacher, unbeknownst to her, was visiting his wife who was in the hospital. And as she entered the room conducting her business there, uh, he said, excuse me, ma'am. And she said, yes. He said, uh, "Is he said, I'm a preacher. And he said, I believe the Lord is telling me something. He said, do you have a daughter? She says, I have two. He says, are your daughters believers? She said, yes. He said, your daughter has been beseeching the Lord in prayer for a job. And the Lord has spoken and told me to answer you, to tell her that come the first of the year, she will have a job. And it was February 2nd, I got employed. Uh, with a very good job. So, and this was just a couple of years ago. So, you know, people who say it's not for today, all I can tell you is, is I can show you example after example, after example like that from just praying in the spirit, not in my understanding. So. Well, sister, I, I want you to pray for me in the spirit. I'd love to have you pray for me. So. I already, no, no, no kidding aside, Brother Luke, I already do. And for all the other saints of God here that get under attack here on YouTube from the various, various spiritual entities and witches that will come after them, uh, like Sister Renee and others who have been attacked heavily. So you guys, when I say I'm praying for you, that's exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. No uh -huh. doubt, no doubt. And I, and I got mad respect for anybody who you know, operates in those gifts in the biblical way. The thing that I think rubs me the wrong way is when I walk into a church and there's groups of people just, you know, like Paul said, they're like sounding like barbarians. They're just speaking into the air and it's, it's really confusing. And it puts me, uh, you know, it's very uneasy because I know what the scripture says that if you're in a corporate setting or you're in a fellowship or a group, that it should be one to two by three the most and let there be someone to interpret or be quiet. And people just all do this all in the open or like if I'm out evangelizing, uh, there's three and four people just, you know, doing this out loud and, and the people walking by are like, what is wrong with them? And I get it. They want to use their spiritual gift, but the Bible also gives us guidelines to where, you know, the verse you brought up, Sister Lisa, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, you know, do it unto God. Don't do it openly and publicly, uh, you know, because Paul, Paul reiterates that if somebody walks in uh, the congregation and there's people all doing, uh, speaking in tongues, they're going to think these people are crazy and it's going to turn people away, turn people off. And so, you know, I don't mind anybody using the gift they, they believe they have or if they have it, you know, I don't know. Like I said, it's not for me, but if they have it, that's cool. I just I just like when they use it in, in biblical order. Yeah. Yeah, I I um I, I did send the invitation to Renee. People asked, oh, "Where's Renee tonight?" So she's always invited, but uh, for for her to join me on Wednesday Bible study and then do her Thursday program and then do Friday night fellowship, uh, you know, sometimes I think she needs a break, so she she she's not going to be with us every Friday, I don't think. But uh, um, tonight, I, I wish she was here to give her her thoughts on this because I've heard her teach on it. It was interesting. I don't think, I, I don't agree with her position though after really thinking more about it here tonight that um, I, I don't want to misrepresent her, but I think she, she would say that all, all tongues is the one, there's only one type of tongues. Um, so next time she's around, we'll have her explain it. But uh, I think that uh, when I look at uh, what happened at Pentecost, um, 
they 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 started speaking in tongues. Let's call that the ecstatic utterances. Okay, it wasn't a question of interpreting and edification. It was just something that happened that that showed that there's something is happening to us, and it was the Holy Spirit was baptized them, and then the same thing. If you look at what when Peter went to Cornelius. Um, that's what showed him that they they were believers just like him. Uh, and, and then when he was challenged by James in Acts 11, that uh, uh, why did he even go into a Gentile's house? I mean, are you, you crazy? You can't associate with Gentiles. And you ate with Gentiles? What? You're saying that they're, and, and you gave them the gospel and preached to them? And, and Peter, of course, said, well, I'm going to do what God tells me to do, not what man tells me to do. But and he says, and they responded the same way we did. I, I, someone can, if you can find the exact verse, I'd be, it would, that would be great. But uh, he's saying, and the same thing happened to them. They no, they believed on the Lord just as we did, and that's why the saying, "What must I do to be saved?" Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, the, the first time we see that language there is in Peter telling James and the Jerusalem church, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they were saved. And, and they just, uh, so this this was a very important thing to prove to, to Peter and also to prove, to, to, for Peter to offer as proof to the Jerusalem church that these Gentiles, are equally saved. They have the same experience. So it was a sign to prove that the Holy Spirit truly came uh, and baptized them. Uh, but then when we see Peter's speech and that thing, to me, that's clearly a different type of thing with tongues. I think it's more inclined, more inclined to believe like Matthias explained it. Peter was just speaking normally and everybody, God translated in their own ears and they heard them in their own, their own language. That's what I, how I would guess it is. Okay, any more before we move to another subject? All right. Um, okay, my my question is uh, to everybody is, why are you so self-centered? Or maybe I should ask, are you self-centered? <laughs> I hope not. Uh, because this is this is the the natural condition of man. We are naturally self-centered, and it's encouraged. People will will actually say that you need to have self-confidence. But uh, you know, we know that uh, we have to put all our confidence in Jesus, not in ourselves. Put no confidence in your own ability to get your salvation. You have to put all your confidence in Jesus. Uh, we're told to be self-reliant. That's a good quality. Right, we teach our children to grow up to be self-reliant, but um, the Bible says that we we need to rely on Jesus. That's what it is to rest. Is we're okay. We gave it all to Jesus. We're relying on Him to not only handle our salvation but handle all our needs. Um, and then there's uh, self-esteem. What what do you call self-esteem? Uh, you know, that's self-righteousness, isn't it? That's not a that's not a quality. That's pride. Oh, Angel Martin is here. Hi, Angel. Um, uh, self esteem, but no, all esteem is reserved for our Savior Jesus. And uh, what else is there? Self, self, uh, self, self centered. Yeah, people who are thinking about self instead of being focusing on Jesus. See, there's the problem. It's all about self. Um, well, enough preaching. Um, anybody have any feedback on on, on this? I, I think the key to understanding salvation and getting getting salvation and then living uh, the Christian life is getting out of self. Or am I making? Amen. Uh, we must decrease so that He can increase. Uh, putting no confidence in the flesh. Uh, yeah, it's it's opposite. Like Paula, Sister Paula was saying in the beginning, how it's very hard to come to believe and receive this free gift because in and of ourselves, we desire to deserve it, earn it, be proud of it. And 
you know, work. We're always taught to work hard and and earn and deserve and and be the best. And you know, receiving God's gift is completely opposite. And the same with uh, you know, dying to self or or learning to depend and lean on Christ. Um, you know, the world tells you to be self sufficient, self motivated, self powerful. You know, love yourself. Self. It's all self centered, and it's tough even as a Christian because you know to empty ourselves of ourselves. And to, you know, lean on God and, and trust on the Lord. And, you know, for me, it's an ever, it's an ever ongoing process. And, uh, you know, I make progress and then I, I, you know, regress a little bit and then I make some more progress. But I, I find that, um, you know, just learning to decrease so that he can increase it, uh, it goes a long way, but it's difficult. It's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to add something to that, if I may. All right. He made me think of something I've been trying to teach my 12 year old. Um, I'm trying to teach her something I've learned from the Bible that uh, joy and happiness come from serving others, from putting others before yourself. And that totally goes against what our nature tells us. Our nature tells us, I want this, I need this, I want to do this, I want to have this, I want to experience this. And so we go after that however we can. And I've found personally that it never fulfilled me, never made me happy. Um, getting what we want all the time doesn't bring what we think it should a lot of time. And so I'm trying to teach her like, the way that's right to a man <laughs> is not the way. And the way that seems right to us is go after these things that you want and do for yourself and put yourself as number one. And that's really miserable. I lived my whole life like that. It was, I was miserable. I only really found joy and happiness in my daily life after I knew God, got to know him and applied his wisdom to my life. And he's been teaching me. Um, so what the world tells you is the exact opposite of what God will tell you. Um, that was just something I've been working on with my kid. I just thought maybe someone might need to hear it too. Wow. Okay, look here. Let me see. Can you see? Let me see if I can find here. Put my finger there. Okay. You see my finger? Is that showing up? Uh, yeah, I see it. So you see where it says joy? Yes, J O Y. Yeah. Are you are are you cheating? Are you, you somehow getting access to my notes? <laughs> we must be on the same wavelength or something, Luke, because that's not the first time I've said something you were thinking about. That's weird. Yes, yes, I think this other is you. <laughs> yeah, 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 that uh, that was here. The next I was going to lead right into that point, and you, matter of fact, you did that. Remember when I, I a couple of Fridays ago I mentioned that something about oh we're talking about um, the. Um, uh, the holy the fall of man and uh, the what happened the death of this the no the triunity of God and that God was made in man's image and I I had uh, like f a half dozen points listed that I was going to go through and I asked you to so you to respond to the first point and you basically covered all my points before I even had a chance to mention them remember that yeah sorry about that. <laughs> Great minds think alike. What do you want me to say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but the, I, I, I have a friend that got me a shirt years ago. It said JOY, J-O-Y, as acronym, stands in for, for Jesus, others, yourself. In other words, if, if we could adopt that as our priority, um, our, our Jesus comes first. We, we want to serve Jesus. The next, we think of uh, other people. How can I serve uh our name, my neighbor, uh, and then last of all is ourselves, if we put ourselves last. But uh, if we do that, we'll have joy is the point. And uh, I, I wish I mastered that. I, I haven't mastered that, unfortunately. <clears throat> so uh, what was that, brother? Are you, did you cough or are you, are you just saying, who? Uh, yeah. Not I tried to sneeze in my arm and try to. I tried to be quiet. It was a loud sneeze. <laughs> oh, I thought it was a form of amen. Okay, uh, Lisa, any thoughts on uh, 
this uh, idea of, of being self-centered rather than Christ-centered and uh, joy. And joy is we get joy from putting Jesus and others ahead of ourselves. Uh, I'm sorry, Brother Luke, I was responding to someone in the chat. Could you re reiterate that one more time? Yeah, yeah. The, the points were that uh, um, we we are naturally self-centered. We need to learn to be Christ-centered. And if you, we want to have joy, we, we will get joy by having Jesus our priority than other people and placing ourselves last. Hmm. Have well, you been able to do that? Are you? Are, do you have those priorities? Oh yeah, I mean, there. I, I've just been going through so much of late, personally in my life, um, and that's what it always brings me back to. You, I mean, I don't know too many believers. I mean, I'm sure there are. It depends on where they are in their walk with Christ, most assuredly, but. You'll be brought out of narcissism quite quick, quickly if you are indeed a believer and you are, I would say, abandoning or attempting to abandon as much carnality as possible to draw closer to the Lord. Uh, because the, the, the more things you go through in trials, you have to submit yourself to God and seek him. So he he becomes first and foremost Whenever you're dealing with something, your focus becomes entirely upon him for your deliverance, for your sustenance, for uh, your edification, for everything. So, yes, I'd have to say absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, what about you, Dave? Have you have you been able to uh, uh, make your life focused around Jesus and not? Uh, yourself and and uh, what about putting others uh, before yourself can you do that yeah well i mean I, like i said i've been growing in that area and becoming uh you know selfless service sacrificial service or you know just putting others above myself you know i've been getting a lot better at that and uh you know i still struggle in some areas pertaining to decreasing in self but uh, it's getting better over the years, and, you know, it's all about the, the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Well, I, I think I can say that uh, I've observed this in, in all of you, that, uh, that the desire to, to serve others and not be self-centered. Uh, uh, every, every one of you, I think, are doing it now. We don't do it perfectly, I'm sure. Uh, we don't really have to do it perfectly. But I think the more we are able to do that, maybe we will get more joy the better we get at that. Uh, let me look at the chat room. Uh, okay, there's going to uh, an investigation of Paula will begin soon. Um, I'll check my house for wiretaps from Paula Hendricks. Um, and let me see. No other, nothing else in caps. I can't read all, everything, so I'm only looking for the things in caps. Uh, okay. All right, let's go back to the, the panel since they, the, the chat room is, does not have anything to ask us. Uh, Brother Dave? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm passing it over, over to you. By the way, I, uh, I heard you preaching last night. And, uh, on the, uh, oh, you, on the you, uh, yeah, Tuesday night get, show? Yeah, you get going, don't you? Yeah, I do. And sometimes, you know, I I write my little notes down and, and I try to follow the notes and then, you know, something ends up happening and I look back down at my notes and it just all goes fuzzy. And so I just get to rolling and, and that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that's supernatural or if I just got mental illnesses or what, but. Holy Spirit takes over. I get to preaching. I just close my eyes and let it rip. And when I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, there's a, a, certainly a lot of passion in your message. 
And uh, I mean, I, I've had some people react uh, uh, and say, why are they shouting? Why are they yelling? I said, they're not yet. Or why are they angry? No, they're not, they're not angry. They're not yelling. That's enthusiasm. That's passion. I see that in Sister Lisa sometimes when she gets going too. Yeah. Um, see, that's what I'm saying. Some people, I, I call it Jude, tw uh, Jude 21 or 23. There's some people it says have meekness and compassion and Sometimes God, you know, uses those people that just monotone or they're like really soft, really articulate, and that's how they reach people. And sometimes, you know, it's like, okay, if you go to church, I'm the type of person, if I go to church and the guy preaching or teaching to me is like, well, today we're going, I'll, I'll start snoring in church. I need the guy to tell me, you know, I need the guy to have a little umph in it, you know? And some people, some people, they need that, and God knows it, and that's why God uses different people in different ways to reach all types of people. Yeah. So Richard asks, does anyone troll the internet and make fun of atheists, or is it just me? <laughs> well, Richard, I'm not guilty of that. I mean, I'm guilty of something, I'm sure, but I'm not doing that. I, I had my time dealing with atheists. It's pretty much over. Uh, I've been on YouTube for 11 years and the first six months was almost completely dedicated to atheists because my, my purpose initially, my first videos I made, I thought I had a duty to prove the Bible was true. Because if I'm going to say the Bible says this, this the Bible says that, people are going to naturally say, well, well so what? I don't believe the Bible. So I thought it was my duty to first thing on YouTube to make sure I proved to everybody the Bible was true. And that that brought all the atheists on YouTube. I mean, all the big name atheists, they came against me for six months and, and that ran its course. And I, I did my best. Actually, there were a couple of atheists who got converted. And, um, but obviously just like everybody, we, only a few. Why is the road to destruction? Narrow is the way. Many or few. So whether it's atheists or just any person, we know that the percentages are going to be low. That's what we have to learn and accept. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get all frustrated and feel like a failure, thinking that why are so few people believing? Uh, well, only a few are going to. But um, I had... Uh, the thrill of actually getting a couple of atheist um, believers. Um, but once I finished talking, to, I finished talking to atheists. The reason I'm expressing it that way is because they, they either, uh, if, it, if it reached the point where they were no more ears to hear, you know, I did what Jesus said. I dusted off on my feet, and moved on. So one after another finally got blocked because they became belligerent and it was a waste of time. So, um, no, uh, Richard, I don't spend my time dealing with atheists anymore, but the second problem I dealt with, which shocked me, I couldn't believe it. I had no idea when I first came on YouTube that the vast majority of professing believers were lordship heretics. So after I worked my way through the atheists, the next problem became dealing with the lordshippers and that continues till today. That's still the number one problem. And then the next problem after that is dealing with the true believers that are jerks. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've got real believers that are so rude and obnoxious. Some of the meanest, cruelest, nastiest people I've met are, are people who are professing faith in the real gospel. And so that's how it's progressed for me. What's been your experience? Anybody here in the panel uh, dealing with atheists and others? I haven't had an issue with atheists in particular on my channel. Um, I mean, my channel is, is primarily targeted to believers, and I don't spend time trying to convince those who aren't believers, <laughs> uh, you know, of the truth. Because, oh, Oh, my battery is... I hope it doesn't cut me off. I didn't realize my computer is unplugged here. Um, because the Bible says that no man can come uh, to the Father or to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit draw them. 
So I always perceive that if someone is looking and investigating, they're interested in listening and hearing what you have to say. Even if they ask questions that might be somewhat difficult or need an elaborate explanation, they're willing to listen to your answer. They're, they're not coming with an agenda to try to convince you or take you away from the faith. I don't, I don't argue with people like that because they're not looking for the truth. They want to make a point. So I, I think they glean from my presentations. One, it's not even targeting them. It's not speaking to them. So uh, I really just, I don't get a, a lot of, um, I can't even recall an atheist even coming at me about something unless I left a comment on someone else's video and they just wanted to attack me because of the, uh, the, the channel name. But I, I have... Uh, a, a former co-worker who I have shared the gospel with a couple of times that I'm praying and believing God for. He's not hostile towards God. He just considers himself an agnostic. He doesn't think there's enough evidence. And, uh, you know, I, I pray for him. He's He's on my mind constantly because... I mean, these people do not realize how close <laughs> we're all one second from eternity. Either you're going up or you're going down. Or we're one second from eternity. And um, people don't realize the position they're in as unbelievers and how um, what, uh, f fragile life is that it can be removed from us in, at any second. And so, you know, that's why I, I hold him up in prayer, as well as anybody else who's not a believer that, that comes along. They may not necessarily be an atheist, but they're involved in some doctrine that would keep them blind to the gospel. And, and they're just as lost as any atheist. That's a really great point. You might want to say that again, Sister Lisa. That was a really good point, because that's what I'm dealing with right now with some people. Well, yeah, I mean, if a person isn't born again, I mean, even if they're a lordship person who's been deceived, they never received the gospel, they never believed on Jesus, uh, people who don't believe in eternal security, they don't, they don't have the true gospel uh, because there's no other salvation Jesus offers. He doesn't offer anything but eternal life. So if you don't have it, you don't have the gospel. I mean, eternal security is not a separate doctrine from salvation. If you are not saved, you're, you, if you're not saved forever, you're not saved. So th this frightens me greatly for people who are religious. They consider themselves lovers of Jesus. They love going to church and being around other saints, but they will fight you to the death against eternal security. And and, and uh, according to the scripture, they have another gospel, which is not another. So they're just as lost as any atheist walking around, as any other person involved in a false religion. If you don't have the true Jesus and he has not saved you, you are one second from dying. And according to the scripture, dropping into hell. Wow, that's powerful. Because, you know, that's the, that's really a huge issue within Christianity today. And I made a post earlier today that went something like this. And I hope that people catch it. I said there is a huge eternal difference between the sinner who is trusting in Christ alone to save them versus the sinner who's trusting in their ability to stop sinning to save them. Right. Or something along those lines, something about there's a difference between the sinner who's trusting in Christ versus the sinner who's trusting in how well they behave or something like that. But because they, there's a big contrast there that that a lot of them miss because they'll say they love Jesus. They'll say that they believe that the cross is enough. But then if you tell them that you're struggling with a certain sin, they'll tell you that you're not saved or if you don't obey or you don't reach this this level or this bar of holiness, you're not going to get into heaven. And so what they're really saying is we're not trusting in the finished works of Christ at all. It, that's exactly right, Brother Dave. I mean, they have not, as we were just, we started the program off with, with Brother Luke talking about entering into that rest. The rest is the security that Jesus has truly paid it all, done it all, and that we're resting in his finished work. And really all we're 
we're doing is going from glory to glory, allowing his glory to be revealed in us as we cast things aside, grow in the knowledge of the truth, grow in grace, grow in love. These are, are, are the evidences of the, of the fruit of the spirit that begin to work in us. But that, that comes from uh, us being diminished and actually let him, him uh, grow, him flourish. Exactly. And that's the problem is that people have to get to that point where that light bulb has to go off. The scales have to come off. They have to they have to get to that point where, you know, whether it be through the strength of the law that knocks them down or whether it be through the, their own imperfections, they've got to get to that place where they have no hope other than to be trusting on Christ alone. Yeah, that's why I always refer to us throwing ourselves upon Christ with the attitude of reckless abandon, like a little child, a little child, like a little toddler that, you know, you see how a mommy or a daddy will put them up on something high like the refrigerator and tell them to jump. And if that child has never experienced being dropped or falling, you better be ready to catch them because they're just going to leap. And that's the way we have to do with Christ. We're leaping out on him, not relying on anything else, just him for our eternal security and for our preservation, not only in, in this world, but in the world to come. Hey, uh, uh, I've, I've referred to Brother Dave as uh, the best gospel preacher on YouTube now. I've also referred to Sister Lisa as the best preacher, uh, woman preacher. I shouldn't limit it to that, but uh, I saw, did you guys ever see that um, that uh, movie years ago from, uh, Van, what was that rapper that was a white guy that was so popular? Uh, was it Eight Mile? Eight oh, Mile. Eminem, Eminem. Eminem, okay. Um, I was in that Big Brother program back then, and I, I had a big brother, a little brother that wanted to go to movies, and he chose that movie to go to. Otherwise, I never would have gone to it. But I ended up really liking it, enjoying it. They had these rap battles, and it was really interesting. And I thought, wow, he's really very talented. Uh, um, but I can imagine Lisa and Dave uh, doing a Tuesday night program together and preaching back and forth like that. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, so maybe, maybe Lisa will, will want to join you on a Tuesday night and you guys can just go preaching back and forth with, with a great, great. Absolutely. Power. I'd love to have her come on there. I didn't know, you know, if anybody's interested or people in the chat that, you know, been looking for an opportunity to come and speak and, talk about some things. Um, you know, I, I go on, uh, talking doctrine on Tuesday nights, uh, you know, 10 PM Eastern. If you guys want to get on there and talk and hang out and discuss some things, if sister Lisa wants to come on and preach, you guys are more than welcome. I'm, I'm always open to having people come on there. Yeah. Lisa, when you get fired up, you're, you and Dave are very much alike in the way you preach. You know, I, I, I can get like that. It's not my normal uh, way of, uh, of talking, but sometimes something gets, out, gets, my, gets my goat and gets me going. And uh, Well, you know, Brother Luke, either I'll get interrupted, which will usually mess me up, and that always uh, <laughs> it gets me a little angry because there'll be an interruption and I'll have to calm down and go back and edit it out. And like, you know, where was I? And I just don't come back with that same fire at that moment. But I also am concerned. I don't want to push people away. Some people are turned off by, by people who get fired up. So, uh, I do try to, to tone it down quite a bit, but the thing that'll get my, my dander up, if I could use that term, is when people come against the Lord Jesus Christ and they attack his deity or his free gift of salvation and they lie on Christ, uh, especially when they come against the biblical doctrine of the harpazu the seized by force and snatched out suddenly. And, you know, I can understand if a person doesn't believe but when they, they come and they want to attack those of us who do, that gets my dander up. And then they want to bring false information that makes people 
afraid and fearful. This is not the spirit of Christ. Jesus told us to let not our heart be troubled and neither let it be afraid. Fear is not of God. And when people bring fear and want to lay it at the, the, the feet of the saints, I get angry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I see that someone else said that, uh, what was that? They were agreeing with you. Oh, uh, but uh, Dave says he used to be a Christian rapper. That would that'd be interesting. Can you still, do you still have any raps that, that you've, that you can do for us sometime? Well, I, <laughs> well, I haven't done, uh, I was into music for a while. I, I made a couple, actually a couple gospel rap albums years ago. And then I believe the Lord closed that door and opened the door for me to, for me to go and be discipled and, and, you know, shadow my pastor around. And then I guess I just kind of got this burning desire to preach and preach his word and learn his word. And the music just kind of faded out. But, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've listened to, you know, rap music my whole life. And then, you know, as a Christian, I got into the Christian rap, but then something really crazy happened. And I know a lot of people don't like this and that's okay because not everybody, you know, likes the same things, but a friend of mine, uh, who I go evangelizing with sometimes, uh, introduced me to Christian rock, Christian metal. And I've never really been a, a rocker or a metal guy or none of that. But eventually as the time went on, it, he just played it so much. It just grew on me. And now I'm like really into Christian metal and it's, it's like laughable, but, but I'm serious. I, I know I, I, I actually uh, check those out, but I usually last about four to five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> It's not my cup of tea, but I, uh, you know, there are people though that would condemn you for that. Just like they're going to condemn us for any little thing. Oh, that they, they have, want. they have, they but, said that, uh, they said that I have a spirit of Satan and, uh, they said that they knew I was the phony all along. And, you know, they always say all kinds of hateful things, but it's all right. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. Yeah. Amen. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think that there's, just as Paul said, he, he became all things to all people to win some for Christ. And there are, there's a place for that, all that, to, to reach those people. The people that are in that arena, someone needs to enter that arena in, in order to get the message to them. Uh, okay, we're, uh, we're approaching uh, uh, 11 p.m. in the east, so it's time to start uh, finishing up here. Um, if you have anything in the chat room you want us to address quickly before we finish, put it, put it in all caps right now. Um, otherwise, we're going to just give it our, our final thoughts here. Uh, let, let, let's start off with Brother Dave. Yeah, well, tonight um, tonight we brought up, you know, a really hot subject. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody's view on it. I just want to say for the record, you're still, you're my brother and sister in Christ, whether we agree or disagree on this matter. And I don't mind. I don't have an issue with anybody using their spiritual gifts. The only thing that, that gets to me is if they, if they're not using them in order of scripture, like it's very confusing, it's very unnecessary. And I just, you know, I find it to be a hindrance, especially to people who are, who are new and don't understand. And then, you know, not, not the brothers and sisters that operate accordingly to scripture. That That's all good. But there are people that are that are rising up in Christianity that are making the claims, like you said earlier, if you don't, you know, if you don't, you know, use if you don't have this type of spiritual gift, you're not really saved. Or if you weren't baptized this specific way, you're not really saved. Or if you, you know, didn't do it this way with this formula and you didn't learn from from this denomination, you're not saved. And, you know, that's a that's a really uh, uh what do you call it? Like a hot button for me. When I, when I hear that stuff being said, man, I get riled up, but you know, all love and respect to my brothers and sisters that use the gifts and, 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 you know, do it according to the scripture. And I'm all good with that. Yeah. Amen. And the, of course we know Lisa and, and Victoria and uh, I know a few others that, uh, but they, they all, they're all doing this in the pri privacy. Uh, it's between them and the Lord. And so who can, who can fault that? Uh, okay, let's go with uh, Sister Lisa next. Would you give us a summary? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I can understand what Brother 
Dave is saying, I mean, I, I get it. I do. Uh, some people do, as I said before, the only place people will act silly, this silly sometimes is in church. Uh, I have seen absolute buffoonery as well. But as I also point out, um, just because you see a counterfeit, it does not invalidate the genuine article. In the same way, if someone announced on the news tonight, it's Friday night, mostly everybody got paid, and maybe you stopped and went to the bank and got yourself some money. If they announced that there was a rash of counterfeit $100 bills that are so good even banks are handing them out, I guarantee nobody would just run and throw their money away just because there's a rash of counterfeit $100 bills and you had some. You would, you would make sure <laughs> that yours aren't counterfeit. You wouldn't just throw them away. And it's the same thing just because you see people do things that are foolish, silly, uh, and maybe not decent or in order doesn't invalidate the genuine article. Right. Uh, and Brother Dave, I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm just saying that so people don't get the wrong idea. Um, we have to be careful to hold fast to that which is good. Okay, We prove all things and we hold fast to that which is good. The, the, the other thing is just to admonish the saints of God to remember that... Uh, Hey, no, not, no one. I don't care who they are. I don't care how long they've been a preacher. And there's some really great preachers out there. No one has the, the lock on this thing. The Bible says we all see through a glass darkly right now, but then face to face. Okay, so we're all doing the best we can in Christ. And we should show that consideration and kindness and love to one another always. I, as I said before, when I do get passionate... I, I liken it unto, I take an example from Christ. His most uh, passionate criticism was against the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It was always against the religious. He never directed that towards sinners. So uh, that that's the, I try to have the same heart as, as he had. It is our Father's will that none should perish. And we should preach the gospel as that we are literally trying to snatch these precious people, precious children from the fire. Because we, we, we have, we might have ideas against someone who's an adult because people have been embittered in life and, and, and they may not be the nicest person and they may not be uh, sweet and lovable and kind and they're very easy to just say, forget you and, and go on to something else. But if we look at them as dear children, as a child that was in jeopardy, of being just demolished when we all act and that's that's how the, the the Lord has been dealing with me these last few weeks and months to look at everyone as children that need to be rescued from danger and I relinquish the mic and blessings to everyone in the chat blessings to everyone in the panel in Jesus name amen sister Paula what say ye um, well, I enjoyed the discussion. I think the way that you have this set up is great because, um, you know, it sort of allows the Holy Spirit to move through someone to bring up something that, you know, would be beneficial for others to hear. So I think it's great. Um, I don't know about much about the speaking in tongues, so sorry I couldn't, you know, add more to that. But, uh, I think what Lisa just said was a really important thing to remember. Um, just because it's unusual for me, if I was to see something like that, there is biblical precedence for it. And so just because some uh, use it for other purposes, maybe, and, you know, doesn't mean, doesn't negate the idea of it because it is clearly in scripture. And there's a lot of things I don't understand, um, you know, in scripture, but there's a lot of different gifts that we all have and there's different ministries and there's different jobs that the Lord would have us to do. Um, like the people, you know, who are people casting out demons? The Bible talks about people who do this and I've seen a lot of charlatans do them, but uh, they must exist, right? 
So just because it's uh, strange or unusual, if we have biblical precedence for it, you can't speak against the whole thing. Um, so I think that was a great point that she brought up. Um, and uh, I, what can I say? I really enjoyed this evening. And um, it was good hanging out with all of you guys again. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And I, I, I want to say that, uh, Paula, your voice uh, is on the line of Cripp's voice. It's just very soothing. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice, uh, uh, like a solvent. I'm not not solvent. What's the word? Uh, <laughs> what's the word? What's the word that uh, the Bible says that the uh, God uh, God is? Uh, no. Come on, it sounds like soothing. Salt. It's so kind of, soothing. Oh, soothing, but there's there's the word that in the Bible about something that calls it. Uh, it's a it's not succulent, but all right. I'm not right. solace. You're not talking about solace. No, no, no. It's. Um, I'm going to think of it when we're when we're all finished later, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm disappointed <laughs> all the experts in the Bible and you can't give me the word I'm looking for. It's but you didn't give us enough of a reference, Brother Lou. Salve, salve, salve. Thank you, Angel. Angel Martin, by the way, if you ever get a chance, whatever, when you ever see a comment, text comment by Angel Martin, make sure you read it. She's a fantastic writer and she's very profound. And look at that. She came over the right word. Your voice is like a soothing salve, Paula. <laughs> a salve. Oh, like a, oh, okay. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Yes. But I would like to say something to Mr. Rich Bob. He wrote, Paula sounds like Matthias using a filter to raise the pitch. I take great offense to that. I sound nothing like Matthias at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's true. I don't think you're anything like you him, know. But... Come to think of it, we never hear you guys at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great! And if you get me to laugh, if you get me to laugh at the right time, I'll laugh high pitch. So, wait. No. Is this is this Paula or is this Matthias <laughs> talking now? <laughs> uh, that's funny, Lisa. Very quick. You you right. Hey, we says like you guys are never rude. You never talk at the same time. <laughs> I, I'm here all week. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, Paul. Were you finished or anything more? No, I'm good. All right, uh, Matthias. Uh, I was going to ask you if you wanted to say anything, but you already did. So good night. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, I, I saw Matthew's uh, comment, which is good to see you, Matthew. Um, I, I was laughing when I saw it too. But uh, um, it, I think my wife sounds a lot prettier than me, high pitched. So I don't take offense to it. I just don't agree with it. But I appreciate uh, being in the background and being edified. Uh, like I said, it's front row seat for me. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I enjoyed that uh, the time with everybody tonight, uh, as I do every, every time we get together. Uh, I guess I'll just say, don't forget to uh, join us. Uh, well, actually, tomorrow we're having a, a special uh, program. We did it two weeks ago with uh, Crips, um, Brian McClurg, Matthias, and myself talking about eschatology. I think it's going to be about 2 p.m. Pacific or 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. <clears throat> Hopefully, we're going to do talk more about eschatology. Uh, join us then. Uh, don't forget to join us Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Sunday church service. And uh, lastly, I want to recognize some of the prayer needs and the people that asked us here in the end. Uh, uh, we, uh, we've got uh, um, a, a for, forerunner story, David. Uh, He's asked for prayers. Uh, he's lost some loved ones, and I guess his mother is very ill right now, and he needs some some prayers to help him get through with that. Uh, and uh, you, I, I mentioned early on, I saw uh, Arlo Walker in here, Brother Arlo. Um, 
he's probably the oldest friend I have alive as far as the longest friendship. Uh, I met him in 1968. We've been friends all these years. And he's, he's seriously ill. He has what would you call a terminal illness. But it's not terminal for God. You know, we know God can, can make it not terminal and heal him. And, and also his daughter is seriously ill, needs a, a liver. So pray for them too. Uh, and I, someone else had a prayer request. Uh, I, got any, I don't know if I can find it though, if you didn't put it in caps. All right, <clears throat> sorry. All right, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you everybody in the chat room and uh, everybody here on the panel. And I look forward to next time. Bless you all in the name of our great savior God, Jesus.